Okay, well, let's get started. Um, Vanda, I've just had a request that if you could just modify your camera slightly. Um, but thank you everyone for joining this call today. Um, this is the fifth in the series. Um, this is the uh, Digital Insights Professor webinar, where uh, it is our intention to ask the question, can South Africa compete in the digital era um, at a global level? And I think that's a very good question. And as we continue to explore this question, um, <clears throat> I'm very pleased to announce today that we will be discussing a topic which is um, not something that I've been um, that uh, clued up on in the past, but I, certainly it's something that's becoming important uh, for all of us to consider, and that is the issues related to compliance and security. So uh, we've got a very um, esteemed panel that are joining me today, and I look uh, forward to uh, getting into the subject uh, together with, with them. Um, so just to briefly go over the agenda, we uh, are going to do a brief overview, and this is literally going to be a few minutes of the PESA and, and the areas that we will focus on in 2021. Uh, we'll do an introduction to our panel members, and then we'll meet immediately go into the discussion around um, this, uh, this important subject. And I see the heading on the top of the slide is, uh, is not uh, relevant, but uh, just to get into the who is Vipesa and what Vipesa does. Vipesa is an industry body in the, in the global business services sector. Uh, we provide our members and stakeholders the insight and support to succeed. Um, since the, um, the establishment of the PESA, there's been a steady growth in this industry. Um, the attraction of business into South Africa has grown over the last um, four years at a rate of about 24% year on year, which is quite significant. Uh, we have aspirations to grow the, this further and address the problem that the country has around jobs and uh, unemployment. Um, we look to adding uh, 250,000 jobs by 2023 and uh, 500,000 by 2030, which is a significant contribution to the industry and one that can only be done uh, in partnership. So this is a partnership between industry, between government, and between all our stakeholders that are hard at work in addressing the issues that the country faces. Um, and as I said, the question that we're here to answer today is, can South Africa attain the status of being a leader in the delivery of IT outsourcing and digital services? And um, I'm gonna, we're gonna move immediately into introducing the panel. And as I indicated, the topic for today is future-proofing compliant and secure customer engagement. And I think this is an important uh, topic as, as consumers and as customers, um, I think it's important for us that we know that not only is our data safe, but that the transactions that we are doing are secure and that uh, that whole environment is safe. So the, um, the compliance that are measures that have been put into place are for our protection, but from a security perspective, if you're an organization that is delivering online services, especially in this digital age as we move forward, uh, security is going to become a fundamental uh, requirement for you to look into. So um, the panel that we have today, we have uh, Vanda Dixon, who is the executive head of One Vault. Uh, she's been there since uh, early inception. Uh, we've got uh, Francois van Amerva, who's the CEO of T-Forge. And we've got Brian Brown Cook, uh, the vice president of business development in South Africa for StarTech. So, um, Vanda, I'm going to just ask you to do a brief introduction of, uh, 
of where you are and your and your role in one vault and things that excite you and uh and then we'll go through the rest of the panel members and welcome vanda Thanks very much, Neville. Um, nice to be here. Um, I think just for everybody, I know it's very much of a PESA um, audience. Um, very well done for those who were involved in reg with regard to being so successful in achieving the status recently. I mean, it's great for everyone. So um, just a word from my side. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, used to be in contact centers for many years, which is where I met um, and know, know Neville from. And then um, about nine years ago, I moved into the biometrics field with one vault. And it really is quite aligned to things that we're seeing in that customer experience and customer engagement path. And that is that we um, market and sell and implement voice biometrics. We are extending our solution stack into other things, into other biometric um, environments, but clearly very relevant to this particular audience is that authentication of your customers in any uh, shape or form, whether it's driving automation, self-service or within the contact center is critically important. And third factor, uh, third factor um, authentication or biometrics as it's commonly referred to is critical for the future success of our contact centers. And I think it's something that more and more contact centers within South Africa are going to have to really look at um, uh, embracing. So, yeah, just a short intro for me, and just to say that my surname has been spelled incorrectly, so <laughs> it's with a CK and not an X, please. <laughs> oh, yeah. my goodness, Vanda, okay. I should know better. But, yeah. uh, it's been, uh, so, thanks no, for no, so thank you, everyone. So, uh, publicly, um, thank you. Mm. And then, um, so with that, let me, I think I've lost the slide in that, uh, all right, well, Francois, if you could, uh, Francois is the CEO of Teleforge or T-Forge. I think you've rebranded and going through a rebranding. And I like your, your new logo, by the way. It looks great. Um, but if you could uh, just do an introduction from your side. Yes, thank you, Neville. And, and thank you to all the panel members and all the people attending. I see we've got almost uh, 35 people on the call. So, um, you know, I've got the privilege of leading this business. We're a software company. Uh, our call... Uh, solutions or products we develop is, is pretty much fundamentally an omni-channel solution that ranges from various types of dialers, intelligent dialers, some AI analytics, BI tools, uh, social media integrations. Um, so, so almost consolidating all these various platforms into a, into a single platform, obviously everything in the cloud. That's what we do. We have uh, a lot of clients, um, call center clients. We only work with call centers as a business. Uh, we probably have 2% of our customer base as corporates. So we've been in the call center space for eight years. Uh, we've grown um, from a very small business to, to, I would say, a slightly bigger business. And, uh, and we, we've got a passion for call centers. As I say, all our clients is call centers. And I'm excited to talk a little bit about the security component. That might not completely touch our core product stack, but that's very, very relevant um, right now within the contact center space. Thanks, Neville. Yeah, thank you, Francois. So with that, uh, last but not least, Brian Brown Cook, who's the Vice President of Business Development in South Africa. Uh, welcome to the panel, Brian. I see from the information that you sent me that you've been around in a couple of industries. Um, so a lot of experience there. I think you, you mentioned three decades of uh, experience in the industry. Um, but I'll leave it up to you to give, give us a little bit more detail. Yes, thanks, Neville. Um, and really excited to be part of this, uh, this panel. And thank you for the invite. Um, so yeah, I recently joined StarTech. Um, for those of you that don't know the StarTech brand, it's the previous Aegis company. So Aegis and StarTech merged um, in about 2018. Um, and what StarTech brought to the table is some strong technology. Um, they started in the space, in the contact center space, but more technology play and Aegis, obviously a traditional BPO entity. So the merging of the two came together, um, brought some great tech into, into the stable. Um, and some of the stuff that I'm going to be showing you today is around that. Um, from an experience point of view, came from a technology background, so spent a lot of time in, in software development and solution, solution architect um, around banking and financial services, ERP systems, um, etc. Um, so coming into the BPO space, probably in around 2017, so quite new to the BPO space, but um, 
understand the technology component. So um, was able to kind of bring that to the table. Um, so yeah, so wanted to kind of share what some of the challenges we are faced with in, in the contact center in the real time, especially with um, work from home and the solution we've created around that and, and what we've seen are the challenges and how we've kind of plugged the holes and, and um, looked at, at the compliance angle because we've got some international clients that we run that are um, needing our compliance to be top notch. Um, so yeah, happy to share that with you later. Right, thank you, Brian. So we're going to go directly into uh, opening up some of these topics and um, I'm going to be um, asking each of the panel members to uh, respond to questions and then we've, we've uh, changed the format uh, slightly this, this time around and um, we do have some slides and so we're going to be flighting those slides but for now I'm just going to end the show or the slides anyway and, um, and then I'm going to just... Uh, ask uh, Sam to get ready. We've also got a poll uh, that we're going to be asking. And um, so Sam, I wonder if you could put up that poll, that the, 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 question, the poll number one. And then while you do that, uh, so I'll just ask everyone if you can just uh, have a look at this poll and please respond to it. Um, I'm not going to read through it. I'm just going to ask you, Vanda, if you look at this particular poll question, I mean, is this what you're seeing with your clients when, when you think, you know, when you address them and they're talking about um, uh, prevention, fraud prevention and securing the contact center environment, yeah. even down to looking at it from a home, from a home worker perspective? Yeah. So, so thanks, Neville, for that. Absolutely. So, um, specifically in the contact center arena, um, and perhaps this poll was maybe slightly misleading in terms of accountant person uh, nations. I think uh, what we're seeing within contact centers is the increase in, um, in impersonations or people phoning into call centers and trying to be someone, someone else is just growing phenomenally. And that is probably one of the biggest drivers to utilize voice biometrics um, in a call center environment for the simple reason that you are relying on an agent to be able to navigate their way through some very sophisticated individuals who possibly as a living for those that are syndicated and you know maybe there's some opportunistic um, individuals that are trying to commit fraud but it's, it's huge and we see it working with the the, the blue chip companies that we um, um, work with currently how this is increasing and how critical it is for them to be able to put in place solutions that are going to not only protect their customers, very importantly, not only their customers, but their staff as well. So um, uh, whilst, you know, many contact centers historically I've seen specifically in BPO will think, oh, maybe voice biometrics is a little bit of a threat. It's gonna cut down on my average handle card time. That's commercially how I've structured a deal. But at the end of the day, the, the, the upside value is absolutely phenomenal for all parties, including the ability to drive operational efficiency. And that's why um, the, the concept of fraud is, is driving the adoption of voice biometrics. And it is something that um, is, is critical to the ongoing success. You know, second factor authentication, to be honest with you, is not sufficient, not in our world. And I think specifically in reference to the, you know, the accolade that South Africa has won. Destination, there's going to be more and more people looking to implement not only voice biometric technologies, but technologies that are going to come from our other panelists that are critical to make sure that that leader status is retained. So absolutely, um, this fact, this stat here, um, it was interesting on the survey that was done recently. Um, it didn't maybe mirror quite that 337%, uh, but on, the stats don't lie because we get that information through SAFPS from the banking, from, from the banks and for them customers and it is, it's hectic. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a critical thing that needs to be thought through well. Yeah, and I think it also depends on the type of contact center, right? So if the contact center is, is uh, transacting economically, then I think there's going to be more likelihood of, of fraud. Whereas if it's just a customer support, I mean, there's not, there's not really that much Absolutely. of an issue there. Yeah, so I agree with that. I mean, many, many people will say, oh, you know, it really is only uh, relevant to those call centers that have got repeat callers. 
And, and yes, if you look at it that way only. However, a very important part of the solution is the ability, let's say you're having outbound sales. If you are able to capture a voice print of an individual or just general inquiry um, calls, it, you'll be able to create what's called watch lists. And if you've had any fraud, you can, you can add that audio to, to those watch lists. And anytime you're making a call or there's an incoming call in real time, you can check against that watch list and you can alert either your agent if that's the business process you prefer to follow or alternatively send that information and that um, through to your fraud and risk team. So it really enables that team within a, in an organization to find that needle in that haystack far easier then they get caught and it's very much reactive. So that's another important consideration. It's not just the customer experience perspective, it is also the, the fraud watch list um, components that are, uh, that are very important to consider. Yeah, and we're gonna get back to this and I know you've got a few slides that you wanna go through just now, but I wanna just um, at this point go to Francois and just to ask you Francois from, uh, you know, Savannah's spoken about the the callers that are calling in and making sure that that uh, you have a, a secure environment from that perspective so that you know who they are and you can actually um, identify those uh, those individuals but when it comes to the rest of the infrastructure um, i think it gets a lot more complicated it gets a lot more complicated about where's the data who, who's got access to the data who can change things who can modify uh, entries into systems, et cetera. And, and also then access, uh, especially when one looks at people working from home. So I was just wondering if you wanted to, if this was a good time for you to just go into just a, a brief explanation of what that is. And, and if you'd want the slides, just let me know if now's the right time. So, so we'll do the slides later, maybe a, a 30 second introduction to, to why I think it's relevant. So. You made a statement earlier to say, how can we compete internationally? Yes, we've, we've hit that number one ranking when it comes to outsourcing, but, but technically our customers, our customers being the, the, the BPO customers are asking, you know, you, you in South Africa, um, how are you competing in terms of your tech stack, your security, your, your network reliability, a lot of big questions around technology. So the big topic globally is, is, a, is a framework that Gartner coined called SAS or SASE, uh, which is a, a framework for network security. Um, and why it's extremely relevant to contact centers is because it addresses various forms of security, but it, it also addresses digital experience monitoring, which is such a real and pressing element right now. So. The problem statement we have is, is there's this journey called SASE for companies to make sure we move to this place of utopia, which is security that encompasses all these things we're talking about today. But the challenging part for, for IT individuals and CTOs and CIOs is, is how do I even approach this and how do we embark on this journey? Because there's so many things we need to think about now. So I want to try and bring some clarity around it and, mm -hmm. and maybe consolidate it into a simple conversation um, and then maybe give some hope at the end. So I guess that's that's what I want to do. Yeah, Francois, is it when I think about security, I always think about it. You know, whether it's physical or whether it's digital <laughs> security, you always look at it from a you know a perspective of what is the minimum that I need to do to protect me at the level that I need to be protected. And it's, sometimes it's a case of um, trying to protect yourself more than the next person, right? Because it's like that that. Uh, that uh, least resistance, you know, when you when when there is a threat, um, is that the case in terms of contact centers and the way they need to view it? That there is a, that there's an evaluation that needs to be done and said, okay, this is how much security we're going to add, and let's because we're never going to be that secure that we can say it's fail, it's fail safe, right? What what's nice about the framework, Neville, is it it gives us. Again, it's it's not my framework. It's not someone's framework. It's 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 Gartner bringing this to the forefront in 2019, making the statement says the world is changing. Contact centers are moving either from on-prem to cloud, plus remote working, plus accessing virtual private clouds and SaaS. The world is changing in terms of that digital footprint. But how do we 
remain relevant in terms of security, especially to our customers overseas that's outsourcing business to us? And how do we take this very complex network architecture and, and secure it, but at the same time, do it in a way that our agents have the best experience with the technology. So it's, it depends on where the contact center really is in this whole journey of digital transformation. And the framework gives us a nice tool to say, hey, I'm currently here on my way there. What is the elements I need to think about right now moving towards this place of utopia where everything is in the cloud, everybody's working remotely and everybody's happy. Okay, so there should be like a journey that people can decide this is what I want to do and this is the time period over which I want to do it and then make it really practical to their business. Yes. Okay. Um, Brian, um, I know you um, have focused pretty much from a Star Tech perspective uh, in this COVID period of getting people to work from home. And uh, when one thinks about people working from home, I mean, there's just, I think this is a discussion that we're going to have for, for a long time in terms of uh, what is best practice, uh, what works, what doesn't work, what are the environments that we need to create, and, um, and is it really that conducive or that uh, practical for everybody to work from home? And, 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 and I, don't, I don't think that is the case. But what has StarTech done? And I know you've developed some of your own technology, but how, what have you done and what is the approach that you've taken when it comes to uh, agents working from home? Well, I think the biggest challenge is obviously COVID, you know, pushed us to, to that, um, that point very fast. So all the operators had to really do something very quickly. Um, and, you know, when you when you're sitting with a contact center of you know two three four five hundred people, you know social distancing becomes a problem just purely based on a space problem. So you had to send people out. So the providers had to very quickly come up with solutions that would allow us to work from home, but allow also the security components and the authentication components or all of these things that are so critical um, to be in place. Um, add to that, um, be bring your own device. BYOD, as they say, um, it's becoming more and more relevant. So we had to very quickly scale and very quickly build a solution that allowed us to, to um, allow that agent to be at home, um, but also monitor their productivity, their, their attendance, all of the normal things that people take for granted are in place in a contact center needed now to be at home. So typically a contact center has access control, it has biometrics, it has a number of different things and technologies and workspaces and all of these security components, you know, isolated campaigns for different clients. But when you move to home, it suddenly is not there. And so we had to build the tech to make sure that that is in place. And, and um, a big challenge for most most operators out there um, that they had to had to very quickly scale and do that, and so so that's where we focused and and it's been usually successful for us. Yeah. You know, I know that I saw the demo of some of the technology that you did, which was um, quite interesting because I think you make use of video surveillance technology and uh, intelligent uh, assessment of the agent environment. Hundred um, percent. Uh, can you just briefly describe what that uh, sure, function sure. is? Hundred percent. So um, you know, cognitive recognition. You know, is the agent actually in front of their PC when they say they are? Um, so obviously, video. You know, very very easy to to view the video and see if somebody is there. But you know, there's other components of it. Um, I might be sitting here and have put a, um, a screen freeze on my screen looking like I'm attentive, I'm yeah, but um, I'm actually sleeping. So we've, we've done facial recognition um, and, and built that into the solution so that we can just monitor is, is the agent actually awake? Is he at, at present at the time? Um, and then not only that, you know, interruptions, you know, suddenly your, your husband, wife, boyfriend, child, whatever um, pops into your, workplace, um, your home, your bed, wherever you are, um, and there's important custom information on the screen. So we've had to, you know, free screens, we um, send notifications to supervisors just to make them aware. Um, but it's more than just, you know, monitoring the agent, big brothers watching you. It's around also monitoring productivity around, mm -hmm. you know, there's many agents that do amazing jobs that are 
on the on the go, really um, creating a great experience for our customers, um, and they need to be rewarded for that behavior. So we we're not only monitoring are they asleep, but we are monitoring what is their activity, how are they how they're operating with our customers. Are they excited? What is their body language? All of these things are relevant. So add to that the compliance component. So we've had to you know. Um, very specifically lock screens when when um, a third party is present in the room, um, somebody starts using a mobile phone, we pick that up, we freeze the screen, we send a notification. Mm. All of these kind of things are, are really relevant, in, in especially with um, compliance issues around, you know, financial services. You know, the, the customer data is very, very um, confidential. So these are all the kind of components that we built into the solution that, that we had to, had to do um, to remain compliant, you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds like uh, very uh, interesting. And um, have you had any experiences of, of people that have been managed uh, accordingly based on being caught out or being... 100%. I mean, you know, everybody, I think, is, is human. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes we, we do get tired. I mean, this whole COVID um, process has been incredibly tiring and incredibly draining on a lot of our agents. And I think we forget that, you know, doing this job on, on an ongoing basis daily, it, it's draining. Um, so it's more to help the, the staff member to say, hey, take a break. You know, let's route the calls to, to another agent for now, take a break, you seem to be falling asleep or whatever it is. Um, so it's not necessarily to, to only, you know, be the, the, the stick method, it's more to also help our agents and, and, you know, keep them engaged. So absolutely, we do find people that, that would, would try their luck. <laughs> And that's normal, I think, I think in any environment. Um, and there's no, there's no silver bullet solution, but it just helps us to, to monitor and just to make sure that we're securing the, the financial information, the customer information, that's absolutely key, yes. and that it can't get into the wrong hands. So, you know, there's other challenges around authentication, you know, sign-ins, all of these kind of things. And, and pretty much um, the, the stuff that Vanda and Francois are speaking about is, is absolutely needs to be there. You know, that's a yes. no-brainer. Yeah, so that goes hand okay. in hand. Uh, thanks, what Brian. Doing. Yeah. yeah. Danda, I want to get back to you. And um, just because I'm sure that you could also monitor the agent side in terms of the voice and the interaction and make sure that uh, those interactions are, are um, authenticated from not just the caller, but also the agent. But I also wanted to check there's a perception that. Um, biometrics is expensive and that it's yeah. only for the for the big players you know the four or five thousand seat contact centers and so it will work there but what about me you know i've got my little 200 seat call center um and is that relevant for me and how do i yeah. you know should i consider it yeah, so um, Neva, good question. I mean, I think that's always been one of the concerns for contact centers within the BPO um, space. Um, you know, you and I are coming from that historically from that area for well, part of our lives, know how tight the margins are and how uh, people watch their, you know, their costs very tightly. Um, so, you know, voice biometrics at some point obviously was a consideration for that. I think from a one volt point of view, we've also known that. We, so some of our deals that we have are with the big blue chips who have done it because of a range of reasons. Um, it's, a, it's been well worth the, the investment in the ROI. But we've also brought on other technologies that make it far more um, cost effective for, as you say, those 200 seaters. So we've got a contact center in Cape Town that's 50 seats. It's all depending on what the use case is and, and, and certain and what they need to follow um, in terms of the business process from their side. So, you know, if customer experience is absolutely critical for them um, um, and if that's the ROI that they can measure and that's the only stat that they're going for, then, you know, that's fine. But um, what I've found, I actually um, have just um, closed a deal um, with a, quite a large company in South Africa. And, and the way we did uh, work with them was to take them through a proper business case. So we got all the input data, we had a look at all the costs, we understood what the loaded cost of the, you know, the contact center agent was, as well as the infrastructure, everything. And, and we were able to show them that by implementing this and making sure it was utilized, the ROI is tremendous. And, and generally I find 
Um, and, and it actually is use case uh, dependent. You see a very good ROI for this tech. And so it's no longer the case where it's this, this previous thought that it's too expensive, we can't look at it. And as I started, we've, we've got a new technology that we brought on board specifically to help with the small to medium sized enterprises, it's just as good. And uh, it, it comes at that price point that the South African market can bear. Yeah, and so if there's small companies out there or medium sized companies out there that want to get a sense of this ROI, how, how available so is we would, that? Be? Yeah, so we would do a business case with them. Um, obviously probably need to sign an NDA because some of the information that we request is, is, is relatively confidential, I would imagine, but it's, re it's not difficult to do. It's quite, simple, uh, quite simple in terms of the core data points that we, that we need. And we can immediately say your RI is going to be five months or it's going to be 12 months, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that really helps people make decisions. Um, yeah. And I think that's an very important, it's not so, so it shouldn't be technology for technology's sake. That's the first thing that I would say. And I think is I just, again, like to reinforce is that voice biometrics or any of these technologies that are coming down into our environments, not even the contact center, just generally, it can't just be as a, a nice to have. It's got to be a have to have. It's got to be solving a specific problem. And whether that's customer experience, whether it's um, operational efficiencies or whether it's security, et cetera, it's got to solve a business problem. And, and that's why, you know, I will very quickly say to someone, you know, your business case is tenuous. So, yeah. um, um, because it's our reputation at stake as well. We don't want to implement solutions that are not going to deliver any kind of business value and then just walk away. And I know yeah. that sounds like really salesy speak, but that's honestly the, the truth. And that's why we're going that business case route because no one can really argue too much with those numbers. Exactly. Okay, and there's one thing that I wanna come back later on and that is the impact on customer experience because I think that's mm -hmm. also quite, quite uh, yeah. a, a big issue. But before we do that, Fonso, I'm keen to understand more about the, the SASE model. So I don't know if now is the right time for us to maybe just spend a few minutes going into what it is. And, um, and if you want me to, I'll put your slides up. Yeah, I think Neville, you know, sometimes uh, yesterday, Brian said a picture speaks a thousand words. So people are visual creatures. So maybe it's a, it's a very complex um, concept uh, but again if we go back to our audience is it's a it's an extremely hot topic um, the the customers of of the PESA members would expect the call centers to understand this framework and to be able to deploy it or have some sort of a explanation or hands on this transition so so SASE is, is a framework uh, first coined in 2019 by Gartner and uh, why did this framework really came to being is because of two big factors that we see with our customers. Now we have over 240 call center customers and over the last three years, before COVID-19 even happened, we had this transition, di really digital transformation where we have this migration from on-prem solutions to cloud solutions, uh, whether it be virtual cloud, private cloud or, or SaaS or, or, or infrastructure as a service, but we see this massive migration of having everything on site to moving to the cloud. That's, that's the first driver that came in. And the moment we did this and are doing this or planning to do it, the security model changes. And whatever we have used in the past is not relevant, all right? The next thing that happened is even before COVID-19, we had companies testing working from home. All right, that, that, that was not a new thing that happened with COVID-19. This happened with advanced call centers testing, you know, growth without investing into uh, more uh, buildings uh, and having their seats at home. COVID-19 only accelerated why, what I think was inevitable, and that's to have hybrid call centers with portions working from home and portions, portions working in the office. So, so that's kind of the two driving factors that's, that's driven this. So, Big emphasis on it, Neville, you can just go to the next slide there for me. Um, this is the, the, the first time we heard about SASE's 2019. That was the research article that was uh, released. And, uh, and what it fundamentally says, and in, in to the right in the highlighted text, it says 
the traditional data center focused hub and spoke model, in other words, everything on prem and my agents and my staff are connecting into the protected environment, uh, optimal for data residing in a single location is no longer relevant. Um, going to the next slide, Neville, please. And again, before I kind of just break this thing down in, in maybe three minutes that I have less, it's, it's, it's Verizon. We all know this. If you're in the IT space, you know the mobile security index from Verizon. Uh, they make a statement there and they say, uh, SASE is a framework. I've got this poll popping up. Hold on. Just kill it. Okay. So we've, SASE is a framework that integrates various security and network technologies into a single distributed cloud centric solution. This is kind of where I want to go to with our call centers, because as we have transitioned with the advent of, of COVID-19, we had to deploy so many things into our security network to do a lot of things to secure it. There's one thing relevant though in this framework that stands out for us and our customers, especially contact centers. And that will take me to the next slide then, Neville. Thank you. Is, is the highlighted three-letter acronym there. Gardner suggests that SASE is a framework. It's a way of thinking. And it incorporates various network security models and solutions, SD-WAN for WAN optimization, uh, secure web gateways, the Z, Z scalers of the world, make sure guys don't watch Netflix when they're supposed to work, uh, cloud access security brokers, what happens if we have SaaS, Office 365, and, and we want to connect to that. Connecting through the VPN to the internet is, is not efficient, and we have that hairpinning effect that fundamentally breaks uh, the, the end user experience. Zero trust network access that not allow by default posture of my network. Firewall as a service and then digital experience management. And this is where it really comes in. You made a statement, Brian, I think it was you making a statement where we have, we have fatigue, COVID-19 fatigue. Uh, our agents are taking a beating. All right. Plus, now we have technology failing them. They can't connect to VPNs. The quality of the calls are bad. Things are disconnecting. We add that on top of this thing and we have a bad experience from an end user point of view, which indirectly translates in a bad experience for the customers we're trying to serve. So SASE says, hey guys, the, the world has changed. Neville, maybe next slide for me. Um, and, and this is kind of the model that we had pre-COVID-19 for almost all of our contact centers. We have the on-prem solution, everything is in there. It's highly protected by our firewalls and, and all those things. And then we have this massive investment in things like VPN aggregators so that we can connect our staff that is supposed to only be like 30% maybe now 100% needs to connect to the core and 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 we're branching from being on-prem to the cloud. This thing, and that's what SASE says, becomes completely irrelevant. What we want to do is, is it needs to become a user-centric security model where the agent is at the center of our thinking and not our... Uh, um, solutions or applications that they need to access because this agent might need to connect to a branch or even sit in a branch it might need to access youtube or something on the internet it uses 365 which is a SaaS. Uh, we're using azure uh, for our infrastructure as uh, infrastructure as a service and uh, and we might potentially need to connect back to our crm that's still hosted uh, on prem in our environment now we look at all these hosts off, and now you can go to the final slide, I want to say. So, so Gartner then says, well, if we're transitioning as contact centers to this model, uh, which most of the, core, you know, I look at the latest stats of people working from home in the Pepesa stats, I think it's like 30,000 agents right now working from home, which tells me they are struggling with these concepts around what decisions do I make as a CIO, as a CTO, to try and get to this place of utopia. So that's a that's a very big conversation right there. On network on the left, security on the right, and uh, SASE says, how do we create a single software or a single point where we can address all these things in my journey to being everything in the cloud, 50% of my people working from home, and I can maximize that end user experience. The last thing I wanna say is, is there's a lot of technologies, you know, you get the Netscopes of the world that plays in the space, uh, Zscalers, Netmotion, obviously, that, that we're very much a part of. But you want a solution, a single, a single cloud solution that can help you on your journey to all of these elements around the SASE framework. 
And what's nice about some of these tech is they even have capability to improve the, the underlay, uh, which is the layer three issues we're sitting with, with mobile data, where we have packet loss and those things. That we can try and do everything we can, not to secure the connection, this is my last sentence, but then also obviously to make sure that end user, that agent is looked after from a techno technological point of view so that they can actually do their job and not be stuck in issues all the time. All right, so security is more than just secure. We have to think about that from a security point of view, compliance, our clients want it, but also how do we look after that agent with this technology decisions we're making? Wow, that's a mouthful, Francois. So how does, I mean, how does a company that's, um, that, that might have a small IT department and making use of all these cloud uh, they've got partners that are serving them on from the IT perspective. I mean, how do they really approach this and 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 and, and start addressing this? These requirements. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. You know, and and there's as I say, it's a hot topic, and a lot of these uh, secure edge uh, um, remote sec security applications is is playing the sassy card, which they should, and which is a hot topic. So how do you address it as you speak to, to someone like us or there's many brands that, that, that plays in this space um, and uh, we kind of see where you are within your journey and, and when you want to go and, and there are platforms in the like of, of NetMotion which gives you the core capabilities of the full SASE framework, also Netscope, you know, I've got nothing to do with Netscope, but we have, we have technologies that plays and that can give a small company or a big company one single platform that will give you the core capabilities across the whole SASE framework. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can also adopt it as a standalone solution, any one of those tech, or you can use it within your current infrastructure. It doesn't have to be a lift and shift. So if you highly invest it into VPN aggregators, it doesn't mean we have to lift and shift that and now putting new technology. No, no, no. The journey is how do we move towards that place that I talked about? And, and they are tech that can help you in that transition without having to deal with five different companies, all of those technology stacks to try and get there. Yeah. All right, well, let's, let's test it, Francois. Um, Sam, can you put up the next poll question? Uh, and there are two questions in this poll. Uh, the first question re revolves pretty much around um, the uh, access management um, areas. And then the second one will go into uh, the topics that uh, Fonso has been talking about and you know and please if you can respond to this we'd just like to see how, mad, how many of you are actually aware of these technologies uh, specifically in the in the SASE model and then uh, we'll we'll carry on talking on this side so Vanda I want to just and Fonso I'm going to get back to you in a, in a minute uh, but Vanda I wanted a quick response from you when you consider the impact of biometrics on the customer experience, that uh, you know that engagement between the contact center and the and the customer, and if there's biometrics in place versus if there isn't. Yeah, so I mean, I can just reference um, um, some of our clients. Uh, one of our um, our sort of marquee clients is a um, um, private bank. Um, and they, um, the decision making for them to to um, to go with passive voice biometrics was purely on customer experience. That was their deciding factor, um, and that is because they don't have branches, they have high net worth clients, and they wanted to make sure that the experience that the banker—that's what they call the agency—banker with that customer was 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 real and relevant as opposed to going through a whole lot of knowledge-based authentication questions around, you know, uh, the traditional, your first dog's name or pet's name, et cetera, et cetera, because that created a huge amount of frustration with those end clients. So that was the only thing that they were focused in on, and they saw an immediate benefit on customer experience in the way ma they managed it in terms of their customer SAT scores and the feedback that they um, got from their clients. So that was the one thing, and they, and they met their target. On the back of that, whilst they were not worried around average handle time, um, because they said they wanted their bankers to speak to their customers for, if they wanted to be on the phone for them for an hour, great, because that's the business we're in. 
So we don't have a problem with that. However, they have seen the benefit of a reduction in average handle time um, as a corresponding feature that they don't have to go through that very laborious process of questioning customers. Um, and that's been a, a benefit that, they, that, is, that is they've realized, even though it wasn't one of their key success factors. So that's the, the second thing. And then the third thing is the ability to be able to, to pick up uh, potential fraudsters. As a private bank, you would probably suspect that if anyone's going to try and get or overtake account, a, a, an account or something along those lines, it's going to be to one of their customers because they are clearly have money in their bank. I mean, we point this coming to me because there's nothing in my bank account. But for many of those clients, you know, they've got rather large um, 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 sums in their accounts. And by putting in voice biometrics, they are, being, they are able to obviate those particular um, uh, threats through and, and through imposters. And we've seen that not only with this client I'm talking about, but a fund manager we delivered uh, the solution to as well, where they have been able to address and, and uh, oh, um, circumvent uh, affords to getting into uh, an account very quickly because of the use of uh, passive voice biometrics um, in the environment. So absolutely, we've seen another retail bank that we're dealing with. I mean, in, a, in the first part of the implementation, I remember the head of the environment coming to me and saying they've seen a 10% increase. They used NPS and their NPS score in a very short period of time. And if that is a strategic you know, success factor in your business, that's a fairly massive jump that you are starting to realize. Yeah. And then I think there's a huge impact on the agent as well. You know, you're offloading that certain process. Absolutely. Not I mean, I, I think, re, as I said earlier, I mean, you are, then you're now not making them fraud protection agents. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot, I mean, agents these days, I, I think Francois also noted it and, and Brian as well, they expect to do and juggle a lot, especially when we're starting to move into more of a blended um, uh, contact center agent environment that is able to, you know, cross pollinate across a lot of different areas. So they've got to remember and know a lot of things. So making them um, um, responsible for making sure that they've authenticated somebody um, is hard for them. They're in the business of actually servicing the customer. They're not in the business of trying to prevent that customer getting service. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great, Vanda. And I think if I could just make a comment on top of that, because I know that there's always um, a challenge when you come to uh, BPO operators because of that cost per seat mm -hmm. um, criteria. You know, what is it costing per seat? And you know, we all, you know, everybody's just trying to load up technology and then provide an ROI. And at the end of the day, you know, you've got ROIs competing against ROIs. Mm. But I do think that as an industry, and and um, thank you for mentioning it, Vanda, but I failed to mention at the beginning of this call that South Africa was uh, a, a, an announced as the number one destination for global offshoring and BPO um, uh, business. Um, but it does put pressure back on us to actually step up and use technology and deliver world-class services. And I think this is one of those areas where uh, providing that secure, safe um, customer engagement is going to be critical to South Africa right, retaining that position. And as a, as a leader in this next digital era, I think it is incumbent on us all to have a look at these technologies and apply them correctly and appropriately as, as you've indicated, Vanda. So, that, mm -hmm. so that's great. Um, Brian, I want to move back to you quickly. And then Francois, I'm sure you've got your eye on this uh, poll, the results on the poll, and I'm going to just ask you to comment on that. But um, Brian, from your perspective, um, as, a, as an outsourcer, I know you mentioned to me when I was uh, in, in earlier calls with you that the technology that you're using um, is available and, and can be made available. Is that something that you just want to talk into quickly, please? Sure. Um, you know, it's, it's no secret that, you know, it's always best when trying to create a solution to use third-party applications. So we do use some third-party applications, best of breed. You know, we're not going to reinvent the wheel, especially when it comes to biometrics, for instance, pattern matching and all these kind of things. You know, there's experts that do that. Um, so we've, we've embedded some third-party technologies into our solution. 
Um, they are available. Our solutions are so available. So we can definitely talk to anybody that, that needs or wants some, some further information. We're happy to do that and share with them. Um, so, yeah, absolutely available in the market, yeah. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Brian. Francois, what do you think of those uh, poll results? Um, I don't know if, 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 is it available? Can the audience see it? I think they can, yes. It's been shared. Yeah, it's, it's such a great depiction of what we see uh, in the market right now. You know, I mean, the fact that no one even mentioned CASP, you know, it, 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 it speaks to a couple of things. Do we know what it is? Or it could speak as well that we don't access uh, SAS yet from, from our call centers, which is things like 365, Office 365. But fundamentally, that's what we see. At the moment, we stuck with legacy VPN type hub and spoke models right at the top. That's the, the most prevalent one. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we look at this, we can see where our clients sit within their journey, uh, the, the STASI journey. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Again, I'm saying for Bepesa's sake, um, Neville, we have to be having these conversations because mm -hmm. our customers now looking at us as the number one place to outsource, those people sit in first world countries and they're going to ask these questions uh, from us. They're going to ask, what's your journey? What's your strategy to, towards uh, using the SASE framework with your security model? Uh, what does the future network look like for you? Um, and, and I can see we have some deficits. It's not a big poll, obviously, but it's, yes. it's kind of it speaks to what we see in the market yeah and i, I think i was expecting this i mean because this is a very techy heavy uh, subject um but i think the point is is that it it translates into business impact and um and has an impact on the business um you know so while we could say well i'm look, my cloud provider will take care of all these things and they'll they'll sort it out um, I think there is a responsibility on the business to actually understand uh, what is the exposure and what is the risk and to just be aware of it because it's not as, you know, we um, I often find that people say, oh, well, everything's moving to the cloud, so it's becoming so easy. And, and that is the case. Um, but when things become easy, it becomes easy for everyone. It becomes easy for the consumer. It becomes easy for the fraudsters. And I think that's something that we definitely need to uh, take on board. And, and um, I'm just assuming that the people that are on the call are not the deep techie uh, or technology aware uh, people. But certainly those are questions that I think need to be posed to the IT departments to say you need to be aware of this and you need to be taking care of it. Um, so, um, Francois, is there... Um, is, is from your perspective, just the one final word on uh, how people should um, address this. You know, is the, you know how how big a problem is this? Can I actually just hand it off to my cloud provider, or do I um, do I need to actually have a, a people in place that at least know these things and are looking at them actively? Neville, I think the question is, is a little bit bigger. The question is. At the moment, we're looking about consolidation of data, all right? So how do we get this one view of our agent, the one view of the customer, the one view of our organization? How do we take all of these data points and see it where it makes sense and we can make business decisions on those? The problem with the world and the SASE model, as you can see, fundamentally, we, we could end up with 10 companies that, that tries to fix this problem for us, depending on how complex our network is. So how we approach this is you need to go look for those brands like the ones I've mentioned um, that can fundamentally help you across all these sectors because that simplifies it. If we want to solve it by having individual conversations around CASP and around um, you know, VPN enterprise, VPN type connections or, or SD-WAN, then we're going to complicate things. And that's where the SASE model really comes in as a guide and a journey to help us to say, hey, there's tools out there that can give us that single view across, across all these core capabilities that SASE subscribes to us. Oh, okay, very good. Um, Vanda, is there any final words from you? Um, no, um, not at all. Um, just, um, I did have one slide, I'm not gonna show it, but I think this, the pack will go out to everyone. I think it's just really important for this audience to understand the difference 
in the terminology for voice biometrics. There's an active voice biometrics, which I said is very well ser serviced to uh, automation and uh, well driven towards self-service and automation and passive voice biometrics is very much contact specific. It is always a dialogue between an agent and, and a user. Um, that I've put in a good description um, of that. And so when the slides go out, it's in there. That's the only thing that it's often confused. Uh, people often get confused at that. So it's important they know the difference. Yeah. Um, Landa, I'm just going to put that slide up quickly so that it uh, forms part of the um, of the recording. Okay. So if someone's okay. listening to the recording, then you can see those slides. And then while that slide is up, Brian, any uh, final comments from yourself? So yeah, just to, to reiterate, um, uh, our solution's called Waha, which is work at home anywhere, uh, meaning, you know, this is the reality. Our staff are sitting at home. Some of them don't even have a desk, you know, so they might be sitting on their bed. <laughs> yes. um, but it includes, you know, an end-to-end -end stack around security. Um, so if you want to maybe just pull up that one slide, the first one, um, you know, it, it's end-to-end -end components that we need to look at. So if you go to the first one, you know, it's the compliance angle, the, the business apps that we need to access, the virtual desktops that we have to use, you know, um, different security channels, um, different devices, so Apple devices and you name it. So, and then all the components around that of PCI compliance and HIPAA and last mile data privacy and scalable platforms. And these are all the components that we had to include in the solution. Um, if you go to the last slide quickly, um, Neville, just in the due to time, you know, some of the cognitive services that are included in the solution are, you know, as I mentioned before, is you know that recognition, um, facial recognition, facial authentication, you know, um, so you know mobile devices being brought into a, a meeting. You know, suddenly I pick up my phone and I start taking a call as I'm doing now. The screen will freeze. It will it will lock the screen um, because you don't know who's on the other end. You know, so a number of different components within the solution. Um, the compliance angle, you know, very much around you know Craig making sure that we're securing the customer information. So it's an end-to-end -end solution. Um, but yeah, I can certainly share some more information with anybody that's interested. Okay, great. Now, thank you for that, Brian. And thank you, Vanda. And thank you, Francois. If, um, if I can just then close out and say thank you to everybody that has uh, attended this uh, month's call. Um, I think in a nutshell, if I could just summarize, I think... Um, uh, while one looks at security, uh, it can be so easy to see it as a grudge purchase, as one would say, but there are many benefits to actually looking at it in the right way. Uh, looking at it in terms of what is practical for your business, but also in terms of what is of value to your business. And in many cases, it does add value. It adds value to the interactions that you've got with your clients and your customers. And it in, improves the, 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 the overall value of the products and the services that you're offering. Because um, in a secure environment, you know, it's just so much easier for customers to gain that level of trust about what you do for them. And so I think this is ex extremely important. And one shouldn't just look at it as, uh, you know, as trying to protect you from the bad. It's trying to deliver the good and it's trying to look at it from a perspective of, you know, everybody wins. So um, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for your participation, for your attendance. And uh, if there's anything, any questions that you have, uh, please reach out to the panel members directly. If you need their contact details, you can reach out to the FESA and we'll make those contact details available. And then I'll also make available the slides. So thank you very much. And until next month, bye-bye. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks, Neville. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Nev. Bye.